we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank, we want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, this is our, or the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. My name is Denise Rosebur Lotu, and I serve as the director for the LDI. Um, and this is our session entitled The Conversation, Stonewall, Civil Rights, and Pride. And so um, we want to welcome everyone um, who has decided to partake in this particular program. I have the pleasure of introducing, um, I, I'm calling him a host, but essentially our facilitator um, for this afternoon, and that is none other than the Dr. Um, David Macy, um, who actually joined UCL in 1999 as a prof professor of English and currently serves as interim chairperson of the Department of English. Um, he has served from 2007 to 15 as the elected chairperson of the Department of English and from 2016 to 2019 as Assistant Vice President in the Office of Academic Affairs, coordinating a range of initiatives in the areas of inclusion, diversity, and globalization. He served as, um, additionally, he served as an Assistant Professor of English at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington from 2001 um, to 2000. 2004. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Macy is the co-editor with Hans Ostrom of the University of Puget Sound of the five-volume Greenwood Encyclopedia of African American Literature and the one-volume African American Literature and Encyclopedia for Students 2019. He has also published essays and presented papers at national and international conferences on topics including 18th century utopian fiction, the adaptation of classical motifs in Renaissance poetry, the representation of gender and sexuality in literature and film, and the history of Oklahoma's LGBTQIA plus community. So please help me welcome um, Dr. Macy as our host um, and facilitator. Oh, well, thank you very much, Denise. It's a really a pleasure to be here. And you can just call me David. Um, this is a discussion really, I mean, I don't see my role as facilitating so much as being part of a dialogue with two people, I, three people. We are a wonderful panel um, whom I really like and enjoy working with. Um, and maybe I could invite each of you, since I wasn't told to prepare introductions, but I could try to wing it, to introduce yourselves, my colleagues, John Stevens, Tasha Giddings, and Mickey Loveless. Um, in whatever order you wish to go. Okay, I'll start. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Tasha Giddings. I work for the um, University of Central Oklahoma as the Assistant Director for Freshman Recruitment mm -hmm. and Community Outreach. Um, I've been here for about five years, and um, I just like to call myself, I mean, just an ally. I definitely support um, the mm -hmm. LGBT. UIA plus community. Mm -hmm. um, as right now, I hold the treasurer position for the mm -hmm. faculty staff association, yeah. and I really just want to help, you know, however I can um, with the community and learn as much as I can and be an advocate. That's great. Thanks, Tasha. My name is John Stevens. I'm the director of undergraduate admissions here at University of Central Oklahoma. I also am the current president of the LGBTQIA plus faculty staff association, president of Edmund Pride, which is a community event that. Mm -hmm started right here at UCO. I'm happy to be here and I'll turn it over to Mickey. Hey everyone, I'm Mickey Loveless. I'm a junior studying data science at UCO. I wear a couple different hats. I'm the lead mentor for our Native American Success Initiative. I am um, campus outreach for the, our diversity roundtable and student employee for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Wonderful. This is a great, wonderful, wonderful group of people. I've worked with all of you in different roles and it's exciting to be together. I guess as a really general way of beginning, and this is a question people still ask, why pride? Why? What's, what's the point? Do we need it anymore? You know, there may be a level of understanding that in 1969 or 1979 or 89, you know, there was a real point to be made, but hey, you know, we can get married now. Hmm? You know, the Supreme Court has included us under the umbrella of the Civil Rights Act. What, what is it we're still doing when we celebrate pride physically or this very strange year virtually? I would just throw that open to anyone who wants to think about what pride means and why. Why do we keep doing it? Sure, I'll add, uh, as president of Edmund Pride, our mission is 
wanted to bring together the community of Edmond mm -hmm. and LGBTQIA plus faculty, staff members of UCO, but more importantly, the community of Edmond. Here's why. One, we never want to forget our past. Uh, started, you know, Pride started with Stonewall. Mm -hmm. And I, it's important that we never forget that. And we pay homage to the brave souls that did everything in New York City back in 69. So I think it's important that we continue to pay respects and to understand why Pride originated. I think it's also important for the youth of what's known as a very conservative city mm -hmm. to know that, hey, there's more people out there like me and that it's not, and there's nothing wrong with me. And I think that that's something that is so important. And mm -hmm. I can tell you firsthand, hearing an amazing story from last year was from a spectator that mentioned that they may not even physically be here in this earth if it wasn't for Edmund Pride in helping them understand that they are normal, that there is nothing hmm. wrong with who they are. And I think that is still prevalent in today's society that there are many different attacks still being held on the LGBTQ community. We have made huge strides, especially with the civil rights acts, you know, coming from the Supreme Court to include LGBTQ and transgender um, in regard of discrimination in the workplace. I think but that just happened. So while that's great, we still have a lot of work to do. And I think that Pride helps us to remind ourselves why we're doing it who we are and it's a way to also break down the stereotypes of what pride represents to others and i think that edmund we do a family friendly festival one that is you know no alcohol it's a different environment I'm not saying one pride's better than the other they all serve great uh purposes but i think what is so important for us is to mm -hmm. that of education and really explaining what the LGBTQ community is because I think even with this new generation of brave souls they don't see it as black and white as even my generation so and I think that that's really interesting this new queer movement and I'm here for it I'm loving what's happening and I just want to continue to learn myself um, so that's why pride's important to me I think that also pride is important just to educate, right? So like, mm -hmm. even if you're not familiar with what the community is doing or what, you know, like you have questions yourself, or maybe you have a family member that is um, possibly coming out or, or transitioning or whatever the case may be, pride is a time for even allies and advocates to come and just get resources and be a part of the community. So I think that pride is important in general, just all the things that John said, because John, you said everything also oh, eloquently, but um, just in general, just again, um, an education piece too, because there was lots of things, even when I went to Edmund Pride, I was like, I didn't know that, like, that's awesome, you know? Mm -hmm. So just to really, um, I guess, unveil or open the eyes of some people that mm -hmm. don't even think um, some of the thoughts or maybe some, mm -hmm. clear some unbiases that they may have had or biases that they have had. I really think, I love the topic of education when Pride is concerned, right? Because even younger LGBTQ plus individuals, some don't know what Stonewall was. They have to do that research themselves or go to someone who does to try to learn more. And that's something that Edmund Pride does really well with that education standpoint of showing different identities, showing different folks, showing different things overall of what it looks like for different people. And so, Pride overall, it's really, we've come a long way, but we still got more to do. And so keeping pride around, keeping that educational of this is what's happened, this is what's going on now, and now we can keep moving forward is really important for my, my perspective. That's great. I would tell, a, I like to tell stories. Um, you heard I taught for a little while out at the University of Puget Sound, a small, private, really progressive liberal arts college near Seattle. I mean, I spoke at a pride event there. 
And after the event, one of our students, who was a journalist for the student newspaper, who had these really outspokenly social, con socially conservative columns, came up to me and said, can I hug you? Which is always kind of a weird thing when you're a faculty member. You say, well, okay, I'm not hugging back. Um, and then after that, she, so she hugged me, and then she said, you're the first LGBT person I've ever met who didn't work in a bar or a community center. And I thought, I mean, it's great to work in a community center. It's great to work in the bar. Those are really core community spaces. And the student was from Hawaii. I should have had that. Another, you know, very progressive state. And I thought, you know, this is kind of why we do that. Hmm? Visibility. What is your, if you're coming up, coming out in the world, your horizon of possibility? The range of things you can be, the range of ways you can be fabulous. I was thinking, this is, I think, the 41st year that I've been out. And, you know, 41 years ago, there were not a lot of models, role models, senses of possibility. What do you do with yourself? Hmm? You know, and you had this sort of stereotype, limited range of ideas. Pride is about celebrating a whole wide community. What prides do well, what Edmund Pride does really well, I think is represent a whole community. And that's pride at its best. We talk about Stonewall um, way back when, about 52 years ago? 52 years ago, June. Um, and that's just one, one milestone along the way, right? There were back in the 40s and the 50s, if anybody, you know, research project, you know, the Black Hat Bar in Los Angeles, um, Compton's Cafeteria and the Tenderloin of San Francisco. There were acts of resistance, of empowerment, going on for a long time. There were national organizations, the Mattachean Society, the Daughters of Belitis, one of the earliest lesbian organizations. One of the co-founders was from Tulsa. Um, so there was a lot going on and it's remembering, but also remembering that Stonewall is about activism and it's about a really sort of diverse range of ways of being, of identities. Um, and intersectionality. Hmm? Remember, you know, people like Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, and others who were gender nonconforming, who were transgender people of color, working together. I mean, and that's one of the things that I think we really maybe begin to think about a lot this year, in this year of Black Lives Matter, of anti-racist activism across the country. We got the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which in 2020, got stretched a little bit to include LGBTQ people. But, you know, we're still fighting for the basic civil rights that we were promised in 1964. Hmm? You know, it, it, it's a work in progress. So how do we recommit and how do we understand all, all of these, these, these rights as something that we're all working for together? That none of us, like a cliche, but it's, it's important. None of us are free until everybody's free. And we're not there yet. I'm, I would say on this UCO campus, we're not there yet. Hmm? And that maybe would be the next thing to talk about. This is one of the questions we, that were, was generated before this meeting. You know, what can we do to make UCO a more inclusive, supportive, LGBT affirmative, proud community? We've come a long way, but what are our next steps? I think to continue what our next steps are, mm -hmm. uh, something that, that I am working on as president of the Faculty Staff Association here at Central, we now have the space where we will be meeting directly with the president every three months, I believe, and we're, we're able to voice our concerns and to advocate mm -hmm. for our respective affinity groups. And during our first meeting, I brought up gender identity on the application for admission and preferred name. So that's something that we're really working on to see to fruition. So that way a student can always be known as what they choose to be mm -hmm. called, not necessarily what's presently on their birth certificate or driver's license. So there's, that will limit the interactions, the unwanted, unpleasant interactions of having mm -hmm. to 
introduce yourself to your instructor and say, hi, my name, what you'll see on the roster is this, but I'm actually this, mm -hmm. my pronouns are this. So we'll be able to use the preferred name and pronouns hopefully soon. So that way, as the next generation of Broncos are merging and applying to our campus, they will know that they're entering into a community that is supportive of them. And once you have that foundational support, it really can help people be in become who they always are or always were meant to be. And I think that that's my mission this upcoming year as president and specifically during those affinity group meetings to continue to listen to the voices of our student community, the faculty and staff members and adequately and accurately convey those messages directly to our president to see what we can make happen to make the University of Central Oklahoma a better place for our LGBTQ community as a whole. I think that's, that's amazing, John, first having those conversations is really tough. Um, I know as a student leader, speaking for a whole group can be very daunting. So being able to um, really try to take so many stories and try to convey them yourself is so important. Um, I think something else for UCO specifically is, you know, keeping that student thought, right? So what is affecting our students? I have a friend of mine who has been, um, we call it dead naming, right? They get their, their non-preferred name told to them or said at the Starbucks. And it's just because the barista just pulled it from their ID. And people don't really think of that is emotional trauma, that is something that can really affect a student. So looking at little things and little things we can change in processes to be able to make students feel more comfortable to be themselves, to really represent themselves and, oh, what's the word, um, show who they are really. I think that we've made some really good strides already. I mean, of course, we there's always room for improvement, but looking from a perspective, I guess, student side, I hear students all the time ask questions, right? Especially high school students are asking questions of, is this a safe place for me? I am transitioning right now, so will there be a restroom for me? Mm -hmm. um, are there people like me? Am I going to feel comfortable? What does that look like? Do I have support on campus? And I can wholeheartedly say yes, like I can without a doubt say yes. Um, and I can say that to say like with pride, you know what I mean? Like, yes, we do have that. Um, and we can give you other options and things of that nature. Um, I think that UCO could possibly expand the partnerships with other, other LGBTQIA plus communities mm -hmm. and things of that nature. I know that we do a lot of partnerships already, but just broadening that partnerships and making those connections to give students more resources. And just like Tasha is mentioning, uh, and as we introduced ourselves, we both work in the admissions and recruitment office here at Central. And one thing that we both thought was really important was a presence of the university at Pride. And not just Edmund Pride, but at Oklahoma City Pride mm -hmm. and Tulsa Pride and really be able in all the other uh, smaller prides just like Edmund that's emerging. So showing a presence mm -hmm. a lot especially and it has to be a sincere and authentic experience for students and we have such an amazing recruitment team that goes out and is so open-minded and we're able to, they even take uh, some of my cards for the LGBTQ Faculty Staff Association that gives a breakdown of the rainbow flag, what mm -hmm. the colors mean. On the back, it, it describes our mission. We don't have anything specifically for the students per se, but whenever LGBT plus students and even those who are in the questioning phase see that rainbow, you know, on our tables, that means something. And it also shows that 
in one of our first agendas as a faculty staff association, we were founded in October of 2016, we partnered and ran a joint proposal through the faculty and staff senates on a bathroom bill mm -hmm. that made any uh, gender related or bathroom that was a single stall use mm -hmm. be removed and become an all gender restroom. And that really, we were the first in the state as a public institution to do so. And that really speaks volumes to the campus as a whole, as well as to the direction that we're moving as an institution. So while that is a huge accomplishment and feat on our behalf, we still have a lot of room to work and engage with our students, faculty, and staff to make it an even better environment for all. This makes me think, as I said, I've been here on and off for since 1999, working with SAFE, our campus LGBTQ group, under its various names for that time. We have been marching in pride parades in Oklahoma City for 22 years. This is the first year we haven't because there was no, no parade. Um, I can remember when I first came here being told, you know, it's all right if you want to be in the parade, do not wear or carry anything that says UCO. Hmm? because the university cannot be publicly associated with LGBTQ people. Actually, in 1999, I mean, that's not that long ago, um, sodomy laws were still on the books in this state and theoretically enforceable. You could be prosecuted, hmm? go to prison. It was a felony, actually, to have sexual relations with a person of the same sex. Um, now, you know, we get a lot of encouragement. I mean, we have UCO all over everything. We are much more visible. I think we've done a good job of making it clear to Oklahoma, we are the most LGBTQ plus inclusive and positive campus. But what are the next steps? The bathroom bill is amazing. Is there going to be a mandate that every time the university does significant renovation or new construction, that gender neutral restrooms are planned? Not just sort of reconverted from existing space, but it's it's part of the plan. We talk about being a metropolitan university, and I think that's, to me, that's really an important part of what we do. What's our responsibility as a major public institution and voice in terms of the larger community we're part of? Um, you know, what, what's going on in Metro Oklahoma City, in the state? How can we lead? How can we advocate? We still don't in Oklahoma have state level protections against discrimination at the state level. Hmm? Now, thanks to the Supreme Court, we have you know, a federal fallback. But as I said, 1964 to 2020, we're still trying to figure out what the Civil Rights Act means and how to apply it. What can we do right now for all those people who are still? I mean, I think we probably all know these people who've lost a job, been denied service, hmm? been denied housing because of who they are, because of their gender or their sexuality. It happens a lot. We get a lot of discrimination. How do, we, how do we get our house in order, but how do we also kind of affect the wider community? What do you see? And I think we may all have different perspective on this. The relationship between UCO and the wider LGBTQ community of our metro and our region. I see a lot of it with students, right? We mm -hmm. educate them on, you know, Stonewall, different sections and parts of LGBTQ. I know NASA, our Native American Student Association and SAFE mm -hmm. have done uh, two-spirit panels, um, mm -hmm. two-spirit conversations, and really having those conversations and giving tools to the students. And then they can, we can really go out and talk to our family members about it. We can go out and talk to other friends and just spread it throughout the community through our connections. And that can really help the overall community from my perspective. And I uh, agree. I, one of our upcoming visions and missions for this recruitment cycle would be to expanding our LGBTQ presence 
So again, I had mentioned some of the presence of pride, but also within the smaller communities. So having a spot at Q Space, Tasha and I presented there last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having a in what I'm really looking forward to and would appreciate any feedback from anyone viewing, what are some places you all think that UCO should be at? Mm -hmm. No, I'm happy to do the research, but if there's a space that means something to you that we may know about, this is a perfect forum to broadcast that and that's something that we can look at for this upcoming year's uh, recruitment cycle. So that way we can get out and really be of support to the LGBTQ students. One thing that really comes to mind is the amount, and one thing I also find fascinating, I'll make this brief, is possibly even working with the uh, SGA at all the local high schools, the like uh, Straight Gay Alliance or whatever they may called now in having a space to discuss UCO and all of the great views. We could even partner with some of the safe officers, bring them with us where they can hear from the student mm -hmm. and their experiences. Because as we all know, our experiences are going to be vastly different based off of a plethora of, you know, gender identity, sex, race, ethnicity, everything. So even while we may share uh, identity, it doesn't mean that we all share the same experiences. And I think that that is vital to have the voices of our students assisting us with the next generation of UCO Broncos. I was at a panel discussion a few years ago, and someone asked, how many sexual orientations are there? How many gender identities are there? And, you know, as I thought about it, um, it, I mean, it seemed to be the only honest answer, and the answer I gave is as many as there are individuals. Hmm? To the extent that each of us experiences our gender, our sexuality in a way that is unique. We can kind of group into larger categories, but I think this is the moment. I mean, I grew up in a world that was very, very binary, black, white, straight, gay, cis, trans, but to, to understand that kind of spectrum. I also think there's a lot, and this touches on what John was saying a minute ago, um, to the politics of location, which is to say, yes, UCO is a very inclusive and informative environment for LGBTQ people, I agree with that, but that also depends where you are in the institution. Hmm? As a student, as a staff member, as a faculty member, you know, there are a lot of people on this campus who don't feel they can be out in 2020 for whatever reason, because there would be, you know, cons negative consequences for them. And how do we begin to, A, create a safe space for those people, but B, bring about some kind of institutional change that will affect the places where, where those people who don't feel that they can be out live and work? I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but it's something I think about a lot. I was going to say on, on uh, someone along those lines, I'm Dr. Mm -hmm. Macy, but um, even having trainings, not just, I mean, cause I, okay, so we come, John and I come from a space of, of prospective students, right? And just students in general. But when mm -hmm. you think about faculty and staff and somewhat of diversity training, um, and what we've, you know, thought to have diversity training. I feel like sometimes when you think of diversity training, and I put that in air quotes, you don't think about the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. which should be in included in that, you know what I mean? Um, and so I know that we said improvements, and I think that, you know, for the University of Central Oklahoma, and that possibly could be taken as a one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, another and I appreciate the comments. I've been reading the comments and making mm -hmm. them, putting everything down. I appreciate Brian and uh, is it Kira for those, or Kira on the recommendations. I'll definitely look into, heard a lot about Sisu. So I'm looking forward yeah. to what we could do there. Um, you know, Cassidy Hedman, Cassidy Walker asks a good question about speaking to the importance of allyship. Um, Tasha, as an ally, did you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I can. Um, 
I think that it's just important in general. And I think that it's just a, per for me, it's personal. So mm -hmm. my allyship to the community, again, I think that everyone should want support in any community that you are facing or any community that, that you are a part of. And so I think that it is very important to show like your allyship, no matter, you know, what community that you are supporting. Again, I support the LGBTQIA plus community just because one is near and dear to heart and two as an african-american woman i also know that in my community we would love support as well right mm -hmm. to, to have support and show support in other you know um groups and so and you and um cassie you also mentioned having race race and disability support again having those allyships in any spectrum of minorities um having that allyship and support is very 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 needed whether it be education education, um, whether it is just um, educating yourself or asking questions. I know John and I have sit downs all the time of like, Tosh, did you watch this documentary yesterday? No, what's it about? And then I'm learning, he's learning, or asking questions in general. Um, so also being comfortable around your peers and having those open-ended conversations and knowing it's from a genuine place, not of a place of hatred or anything like that. You know, that brings me to, with the trainings, another uh, um, item that I proposed to the president is a training for what's known as safe, you know, safe zone training is what we, but I also think that it needs to be done on an institutional level yes. opposed to a uh, faculty staff for safe. That should be seen as an important uh, thing that the institution provides for all of us. And that's how we also feel support because we're clearly wanting ourselves to be supportive and we're going to have a better understanding of how we can reach out to our students. But there becomes a whole different level of support and recognition whenever it is a university mission and is done and executed by members hopefully they'll take uh have us on the board to help uh design and flush things out but it is important that it comes not necessarily from an affinity group yeah. but yeah. rather a support from the top down yeah that's one thing that i find really interesting right you both kind of brought it up looking at diversity and inclusion um, a lot of people see it as diversity, as race, as a mm -hmm. racial outlook. Um, me and Liz Tabach are coordinator, not coordinator now, she's now assistant director of retention. We have these conversations all the time of diversity is just something about you that does not fit the majority, right? So if you have a disability, if you are a different gender orientation, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. a different race, something about you that is, can be considered different, um, that can kind of people can make you sort of try to exclude you with it um so sort of looking at trying to keep those like safe zone trains and everything that that is diversity that's working to diversify campus working to create an inclusive and equitable environment for students for faculty for staff for the entire uco population just to pick up on a couple of things in the chat you know, this community is also excluded from the conversation on diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, one thing that I have been doing for 20 years um, is being the cameo guest speaker at various trainings, events, come in, talk to us for, you know, 20, 50, 95 minutes, of everything you ever wanted to know about sexuality and gender, and then the box gets checked off. We did it. And you know, there's no real change. Um, and then, you know, then a lot of the time, you know, we're not at the table, to be honest. Hmm? One of the things allies can do um, is, is to be that voice. Um, someone said to me a few years ago, you know, do you hear many homophobic or transphobic remarks at UCO? And I thought about it, I said, yeah, no, I don't really. But does that mean that people aren't making them? Or does it mean that I've been out for so long on this campus that people think, oh, he's here. Hmm. So we better not say that. Um, but what, what allies can do is be in those spaces and those conversations 
where the community is not visibly present. Hmm? And to say, wait a minute, why are we not also talking about, and that's not just gender and sexuality, it's race, ethnicity, ability, socioeconomic background. Why is this not being considered? Hmm? You know, it's not just the job of the people in that, that mm -hmm. community to be their own advocate. Yes, we have to be our own advocates, but we need to be each other's advocates as well. And that's trying to, and, and make that a part, part of training. We talked, I mean, there was a comment in the chat about, you know, healthy life skills. Hmm? Why are we not talking about sexuality and gender? Those are important parts of our health. Physiological, psychological, um, spiritual, if you will, that's all part of it. Uh, teaching people to be allies. The other thing I would add is, you know, we're all allies um, to each other. And we talk about LGBTQIA+, like that was a lump. It's kind of nice that there are more letters now. But, you know, I'm, I'm a gay man, a cisgender gay man. I'm, I can be an ally to transgender people, to genderqueer people, um, to two-spirit people, but I'm not any of those things, although we're kind of all lumped in a group. Hmm? And so, I mean, I have a responsibility also to be, you know, in conversations where those, where other parts of the LGBTQIA umbrella or continue are not being heard to say, wait a minute, why, why not? Hmm? Who's missing here and why? That's a really excellent point, Dr. Macy. I'm glad that you made, because I think that that goes as, as president of those two organizations, I, recognize that my experiences may be different than others. Mm -hmm. I need to pay attention to learn and to educate myself. And like Tasha had mentioned, mm -hmm. I, watch a, I watch a lot of documentaries. A good mm -hmm. one I watch right now for everyone listening is Disclosure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe it's on Netflix. Watch it if you haven't. It's an amazing documentary. Um, so I think that it's just important to understand everyone's backgrounds and having those heart-to-heart -heart conversations in coming from a place, I think as long as you preface that, hey, I have some questions that I would love to engage you with, do you mind? As long as you're coming from a place where you're starting out the dialogue similar to that, because a lot of people have different experiences. Sometimes we've been asked questions and what we thought was a safe space only for those words to be weaponized against us yeah. or to be made fun of or whatever that may look like. So I think that it's so important for allies to speak mm -hmm. on our behalves whenever we're not there. Mm -hmm. If you're not at the table, ask <clears throat> questions, why isn't someone within this community present? I think it goes to all aspects from hiring to decision making to strategy everything has to come from an understanding that the one size fits all approach isn't gonna work. And to really come from a place of questioning and making sure, I don't know anyone who won't ask questions or answer questions rather, but sometimes it's important to also, if you're asking questions to say, hey, just let me know if I cross the line, things that you don't wanna talk about, just be upfront here are some of my questions, and then also know that sometimes they're not gonna answer those questions and that's totally fine because that's their experience, those are their lives. So I think that that's an important uh, thing to think of whenever you're talking to allies or for allies to talk on our behalf, but also if you're approaching someone as an ally and genuinely have questions, I think that's a great way to engage. We have a couple of questions from the Q&A that I think are in some way related. In what ways is UCL looking to incorporate LGBTQIA plus topics in the curriculum? And also we really need an LGBTQ one-stop, a mothership, sort of gather together all of the various programs and initiatives. Um, I would say, and that ties into something that John was just saying, um, I do a little bit of teaching of LGBTQ literature and culture. I'm largely self-taught. I mean, I'm a product of an educational system and era in which there was really no identifiable LGBTQ focus, space, or specialization. 
and I've kind of learned things just by reading, um, hiring, hiring. Hmm? I mean, that's a big thing. It's a big thing in every area of diversity on this campus. Hmm? You know, we say we are the Metropolitan Community University. We want to reflect the, the demographics, the diversity of the communities we serve. I mean, we look around, we're not there hmm? by any means. And how do we get there? I think many departments, the English department among them, we're really looking now to you know, hire people who bring that kind of you know, both personal experience, but also academic training to talk about gender and sexuality. It's interesting to know, uh, um, we had, it was a few years ago, you know, we started the you know, gender and sexuality studies minor. Hmm? And you know, interdisciplinary minor, you see as a gamble. A lot of them don't really ever take off. That took off. It became huge. We now have a major in women's gender and sexuality studies. Uh, I think we're going to see more. There's a kind of generational change, probably, and we can accelerate that. I also think it's really important in adding curriculum about LGBTQIA or any other set of identities to, so yes, do it. But I think we've, we've fallen into the habit, in my experience, of just sort of adding in a like we had, here's a course, hmm? here's the syllabus, we added a book, hmm? you know, and now, you know, it's like checking off the box when somebody comes and makes a presentation. It's diversified. No, it's not. Hmm? How do we really rethink in a big way? What does our core curriculum look like? You know, is there a diversity element or even better, is there some way to make sure that in all of the areas of the core, various aspects of human diversity, including diversity of sexuality and gender, race, ethnicity, culture, ability, socioeconomic status, are really there in the forefront as primary areas of interest of study, or primary ways of knowing. That's gonna take a lot of work. Hmm? And I think we, we're all part of that. Faculty have an important role. Students have an important role. People who are in missions, enrollment, recruitment, you know, you know the pulse of what students are looking for and prospective students. And, and that we need to hear that. Students, you know, need to say, you know, we, we're not getting this. Where is it? We, and, you know, we, I, I think this is a really, really important issue. We, you may know we just hired a new vice president of, I'm going to say it wrong, enrollment and student success. Yep. Hmm? <laughs> How many times have the names of things changed here in 20 years? Mm -hmm. um, we're, the next step, as I understand it, is to be in the search for a new provost, vice president for academic affairs, the chief academic officer. I mean, I would say during that search process, hmm, when we're talking with people, when we, there are forums to gather feedback, curriculum, that's, that's an academic affairs project. We say, you know, are we looking for people who come in with a vision? with experience of making this kind of, of, of curricular, sort of worldview transformation in terms of how we teach and learn. Is that going to be a priority assignment for whoever is the next provost slash vice president of academic affairs? And we probably all need to be saying that a lot. Yeah. There have been some talk, and maybe this was just in conversation, of mm -hmm. having possibly some diversity um, classes mm -hmm. uh, in, entered in as, as a core. Um, yeah. I know when I was a student, there were several more than what they are now. Like there was yeah. different one, and, and, it, and granted that was umpteen years ago, but yeah. there was some. So I, yeah. I think that the conversations are being started, like you said, Dr. Macy, it's just mm -hmm. the implementation at this point of, Who's going to teach it? What does that look like? And, and what does that, um, mm -hmm. again, like, like, I mean, what, but what does that look like? Also, I do know that we do, and I, I'm, Mickey, please correct me if I'm wrong, or John, mm -hmm. um, the Faculty Staff Association also has a initiative program for the LGBTQ um, community. Is that correct? Is it still going yes. on? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I do know that, you know, to answer the question of curriculum, there's mm -hmm. really not a curriculum per se, but there is an initiative program, yes. especially for those students. Yes. So I think that's very important as well, that if you don't see it in one space, you see it in another space, and hopefully, overarchingly, mm -hmm. it will be overall on campus versus just one pocket of diversity and inclusion. Yes, and that's a great point that, uh, 
we have felt to mention and a very important point mm -hmm. is the recent formation at started last summer so we're right out of year so yay um of the lgbtqia plus uh students mm -hmm. s initiative and it's held up by a great team and mm -hmm. it's very impressive and i'm glad that that formation has is now in its um, uh, coming up on second year to go back to a point of advocacy. I think that this is a stage and as we're hiring a provost, I think it's so important for the students to express their desire in adding this to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. There is power in the students' voices and whenever students are the ones who are expressing the desire and the need for this and it's not coming from once again the token person, mm -hmm. you know, it's like yeah yeah we know we, you want this but what it means it to something totally different whenever mm -hmm. students are the ones who are advocating, supporting, and asking those hard questions and it's not coming from faculty and staff. So I would encourage any and all students who are watching this and on this panel to continue to advocate for what you would like to see um, as a student of Central. I know DRT, we have focused over the past multiple years of diversifying the core mm -hmm. and the leadership, student leadership, they were amazing individuals, close friends of mine from the where I first came here freshman year. Mm -hmm. And so they've really looked at different ways to focus on that. What is a different type of course? What is something else to focus on? And so I know we would like to continue that. So hearing these different ones, different thoughts of different classes mm -hmm. will be really great. I know in the chat it um, I don't want to miss I don't want to miss this but um, mm -hmm. Janelle made a good comment or asked a question is there she shared a story about there's a verbal altercation at Bronco Lake mm -hmm. and over the microphone with the religious um, organization and someone of the community um, and her question is there is there anything we can do to ensure the emotional safety of our students mm -hmm. um, specifically concerning outside visitors to our campus um, I don't know if I can, I can speak to the outside visitors to our campus, but I do know I can speak to the emotional support mm -hmm. going on to like the allyship that we've talked about or advocacy. If you do see that happening, if you can interject, interject in a safe way, if you feel mm -hmm. comfortable as well. Yes. Um, also, I would just say for the student safety as well, I mean, if you do need to pull them to the side and direct them to anyone on campus that you may know is supporting mm -hmm. the community, definitely put them in that pocket and give them those resources as well. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that or has any other resources, but that was just the first thing that came to my head. This kind of follows along with what John was talking about with um, a safe zone, right? A safe mm -hmm. zone could be an office, it could be a room, or it could be a person, a person who's just there to hear what you have to say, there to support you. So in a situation like that, really just try to, um, if the conversation's not going anywhere, try to get your friend to realize it's not going anywhere, voice their concern with you, um, really try to hear them out and be there for them because that is an emotional time. And I think part of our, our role as a university may be to make sure that, you know, no one side or position monopolizes discussion. There are, in fact, a large and growing number of LGBTQIA plus inclusive affirmative religious communities in Oklahoma, in Edmond. Hmm? We had, she had as part of Edmund Pride last year, a pride service, hmm? you know, led by, you know, openly LGBTQIA plus clergy and, you know, lay leaders um, and a huge crowd turned out. But we don't always hear that. And I think we often see a kind of polarization that LGBTQIA plus is over here and the, the religious community, which is no more a single community than LGBTQIA plus is is over there. So what do we do proactively to make sure that these other voices, these other ways of being religious, of you know, thinking about and talking about sexuality and gender in an affirmative religious context get heard right here on this campus too? And we may have to go out of our way to invite that discussion in. SAFE has done forums for many years. We've had you know, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, people speaking about what it means to be inclusive, to be informative, to be an LGBTQIA plus person of faith, whatever that faith may be. And I wouldn't- I think we're, oh, go ahead, John. 
So, oh, I'm sorry. I would also encourage everyone, if you're wanting some of those resources, check mm -hmm. out the Edmund Pride pages on Facebook yes. and Instagram. Mm -hmm. We always broadcast uh, our vendors, networks, upcoming events, mm -hmm. a ton of education, um, educational resources. We really mm -hmm. even devote certain weeks to uh, different, uh, I'm sorry, um, not statuses, uh, sort of like we break down what LGBTQIA, you know, we talk about each and every uh, sexuality and gender, all, and we do it in a way that helps to educate the community. So I, I've always learned every single year just from our amazing board members, because again, our board is so diverse and everyone has bring something unique to the table. And I highly recommend following the page just for tips and education purposes and to find resources within the community and even within the uh, affirming churches. As we're coming towards the end of our time, maybe I would invite everybody to think about what do we do now? Pride Month just ended. You know, and you actually already are starting to see a lot of the, the visible pride paraphernalia that various organizations, businesses, and churches posted for June getting wrapped up for next year. Hmm? What do we do? How do we do? What does it mean to keep pride and all that it represents alive and vital between now and next June? Especially in a pandemic. Definitely keep those conversations going. Pride, yes, it is a month and it is a celebration this month, but you should be proud all year long of who you are and be educating on who you are and your community as you go through life. So definitely, you know, keep those conversations going, keep talking, keep educating family, friends, community members. I would say keep, again, like Mickey said, keep having the conversation going. Um, starting with action even, going to your legislators or going to your representatives and mm -hmm. definitely pushing the questions and asking them where, mm -hmm. what, what is your stance lie and what are you going to do about it, right? Um, like John said, when it comes to our students, you know, you guys have a voice. If you guys want to see something done, especially for this university or institution, then let it be known and say, hey, this, like, I want to see this change. Um, students have more voice than what you even think sometimes, you know what I mean? So I definitely think that as students, faculty, staff, I mean, whatever um, community that you do feel a part of or want to be ally and advocate for, just definitely having those conversations and really talking to people and making, progressing for change, progressive, progression for change. Yeah, and I can add on that Edmund Pride celebrates in October, Gay Pride History Month. And this year we're going to have a lot of interactive uh, events, a lot of different, something for everyone. So again, I, for the shameless plug of Edmund Pride, but definitely follow our page because mm -hmm. I think it's a great way to share um, resources and just anyone and we welcome anyone and everyone. And our mission is to educate and just finding a place of acceptance and understanding. And I hope that we can continue to do that this year, um, just in a virtual format. For me, pride is, among other things, it's about visibility. You know, I think that's something that we're all saying in different ways that um, it's about saying we're here. Hmm? We're queer. Um, and, or we're allies, hmm? and we need to be part of these discussions. We need to help determine where we're going and what we're doing as a larger community. So I just think being out and proud, yes, at pride parades, but throughout the year, always pride. And I think it's exciting to see the younger generation and how accepting they are. So I even yeah. having my nephew, um, he didn't know I was gay, per se. I mean, he's only like nine. Mm -hmm. But he showed up to the Pride event. 
he went and bought a rainbow flag. He's not gay, but I thought that was so cool. He tied it around his neck. He got a little gay pride uh, stamp on his face and was just running around wreaking havoc. But it was so cool to see. I don't think I would have seen a straight nine-year-old whenever I was in high school running around with pride. Mm-hmm. So just seeing that was so cool to see. Um, and there were many other people. So I think that it's just a continual work from our allies, even if they're nine years old. I think that speaks volumes because I see hope in the next generation just based off of my nephew and his kind heart. And I know that there's many more out there like that. So just want to add that. All right. Thank you um, so very much. I'm sorry, Dr. Macy, if I um, cut you mm-hmm. off. Are you going to say anything? Okay. Well, no. thank you all. Um, and thank you to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion for making this event possible. Hmm? I think this is important. Hmm? Yes, thank I you. Agree. I agree. Thank you all so very much. We're so appreciative of the time that you spent with mm-hmm. us. We thank our attendees um, for joining in and, and participating and engaging with us um, as well. I do want to make just a really quick announcement that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion will be hosting um, Sharp framework workshop next mm-hmm. Friday at 1130. So our okay. SHARP framework was first introduced during our how to support your students during social unrest session. And the cool thing about the framework is that it doesn't just apply to um, students who may be um, ethnically um, minority students, but it applies to all students. So the very same students that um, Dr. Macy, John, Tasha, and Nikki um, were speaking about um, in this session as well. So I encourage everyone to join us. It's just 30 minutes. Again, it'll be next Friday, July 10th at 11.30. Um, you do have to register for it, um, so we'll be sending out more information regarding that. Again, we thank our conversationalists. Um, I have learned a lot. I appreciate the time that you guys have spent, and we will see you guys next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.